A recent study was released by the New Delhi-based NGO called Toxics Link that measured the amount of microplastics that were present in salt and sugar samples from India. The study compared the differences in quantities of microplastics between 10 salt brands and 5 sugar brands and it comprehensively laid out details about the type, shapes, sizes and colours of pieces of microplastics that are present in these samples. The report and study concluded with recommendations to improve existing manufacturing processes, to shift away from plastic use, enhance regulation standards, promote research and development and enhance public awareness, among other suggestions that were the conclusion of the study. The findings of the study show that 100% of the salt and sugar samples, that is all 15 samples from leading salt and sugar brands in India, contained microplastics. This is hardly surprising and very much well expected, but they have been interpreted with varying levels of panic across various media outlets. Today, there are microplastics and nanoplastics all around us, in every corner of the world, inside every living being, in the air we breathe and the water we drink. They come from both industries and plastic items that are ubiquitous around us in our everyday life. Their nature and lack of data about their long-term effects on the environment and health lead to a certain lack of perspective in the evaluation of studies that come out around microplastics. So what exactly are microplastics? How do they affect us? How are they formed? And what do we know about them? And by extension, how do we interpret studies that come out about microplastics? We've talked about all of this before in various forms. Let us look at all of these basics and examine them today in this episode of Pure Science. What exactly are microplastics? As the name suggests, they are microscopic plastic pieces. These are tiny pieces of plastic that range in size from 5 millimeters to 1 micrometer. They are produced by larger pieces of plastic that are constantly eroding and breaking down into smaller pieces, as well as from plastic pieces that are directly manufactured at this scale and released into the environment. Primary microplastics are these, the ones who are manufactured this small and released into the environment in the same form in which they were manufactured because of the way in which they are used. Secondary microplastics are those that are produced by the degradation of larger pieces of plastic. These microplastics exist around the world in various shapes, sizes, forms and colours and they just like every other piece of plastic, are composed of polymers. So far, we've heard the term microplastics that we are probably quite familiar with, but as a society, we really haven't even started talking about nanoplastics yet. Nanoplastics are even smaller than microplastics. They range in size from 1000 nanometers all the way to just one nanometer. Owing to their size, they are less understood and they are much more prevalent as compared to microplastics. And precisely because of this, they pose likely more risk to us than microplastics do. Micro and nanoplastics together are referred to as MNPs and that's how I'll be referring to them in the rest of this video. Plastics are produced as a byproduct of fossil fuel and they have been around since the late 1800s, exploding in growth in the second half of the 20th century. Why so? Because of course, they are extremely easy to manufacture, they are flexible, they are cheap, they are durable, and they are long-lasting. So as a material, they have offered numerous benefits to the growth and development of the world around us. But of course, that's not without consequence. Where are microplastics and nanoplastics found in the world today? Today, MNPs are found in all corners of the world without exception. Studies have shown that MNPs are present in varying levels at the top of Mount Everest as well as the bottom of Mariana Trench. They are present inside polar ice samples. They are present deep within all oceans, including the Antarctic Ocean. They are present inside soil as well as inside plants, which they get through to the roots. 
Of course, they are present inside all marine mammal and bird life and their toxicity increases as these species are consumed through the food chain and they are present inside the human body. Nanoplastics especially are tiny enough to reach the protection that our brain has called the blood-brain barrier, which prevents not just blood but also harmful pathogen from our bloodstream entering into our brain. This is a naturally protective membrane that exists outside of our brain and microplastics and nanoplastics can cross this barrier and they have been detected in human brains. MNPs have also been detected in the placenta, in the blood of fetuses and newborns, inside breast milk, inside tentacles and in semen. They are also present freely in the air that we all breathe in and experts speculate that in the future they could concentrate enough in the upper atmosphere to affect clouds and weather patterns. The largest source of micro and nanoplastics is clothing and laundry coming from synthetic fibers followed by tires on roads, on vehicles, and food and water packaging, and cosmetics and skincare, as well as industrial processes. They occur in the form of fibers, glitter, pellets, beads, films, and fragments of random shapes, all of which are almost microscopic. Around 35% of all MNPs in the ocean come from clothing. However, there are other sources as well, and these come from everywhere around us. How exactly are these pieces of plastic harmful to humans? Well, the risk assessment around MNPs stands at a very nascent stage, owing to a very unique problem that is encountered specifically by those who are attempting to study the health risks of microplastics. That is, there are no controls. This means that there is nothing without microplastics that can be compared to study the long-term effects of microplastics inside living beings. And therefore, what studies do instead is they focus on outcomes over time. Studies show that microplastics that are smaller than 20 micrometers can penetrate organs, while those smaller than 10 micrometers can enter the brain and placenta. Studies examining health effects of MNPs accumulating in our blood vessels and in our body have shown an association with cardiovascular health risks such as stroke and heart attack and even death. Experiments in the lab have shown that they are also carcinogenic and smaller particles, ones that are smaller than one micrometer, have been found inside of cancer cells in our bodies. There is absolutely no doubt about the toxicity of MNPs, about microplastics and nanoplastics and their potential effects on the body. But what exactly these effects are and what they can do to different parts of the body is almost entirely unknown just yet. So what exactly did this new study of sugar and salt find out about microplastics in them? This study considered samples from 15 popular brands in India, 10 salt brands and 5 sugar brands, and it attempted to quantify the weight or amount of microplastics in these samples. As expected, MNPs were found in all samples at varying concentrations. The study followed along the lines of various other countries that have also been attempting to quantify microplastics in sugar and salt as one of the primary ways of microplastics entering the body is through ingestion of food. Other countries that have done this include China, Australia and France and in fact there have also been previous studies from India examining microplastics in salt and sugar samples. This study found that in these salt and sugar samples Pieces of microplastics ranged from about 6 pieces per kilogram to about 89 pieces per kilogram. These pieces were anywhere from 0.1 to 5 millimeters in size. There were also of different colors, primarily black, blue, red, white, violet and transparent. The study did not even analyze nanoplastic particles. These are only microplastics. Now, the dangers of these microplastic samples are not elaborated upon in the study as our understanding of their effects is still limited. However, owing to the material nature of how they exist and how they circulate in our bodies, they are highly likely to lead to several long-term health problems, even passing down through generations as they can pass down through the placenta and newborn blood. 
They are currently associated with cardiovascular issues as well as cancer and are responsible for a host of other conditions as well, which we might not even yet clearly know. So what do these studies on micro and nanoplastics aim to even do? Owing to their omnipresence and the ubiquitous use all around us, MNPs are extremely hard to be entirely removed from daily life. Filtered water stored in plastic bottles get filled with microplastics again, and filtered salt that is added onto a dish that is being cooked on a nonstick pan once again fills up with microplastics. We breathe in microplastics from the clothes we wear every day and the air and the daily objects that we use. Even recycled plastic continues to produce and release tinier particles of plastic. All of the world's plastic that has been produced so far will remain on Earth for millions and millions of years, leaching MNPs into the environment unless they are actively collected and removed and stored the way we store nuclear waste today, completely cut off from the atmosphere and the rest of the world. But we are very far from this. And studies on microplastics today form a part of very, very early literature that would eventually lead us to be able to quantify and measure microplastics in the environment, their effects on life and the environment, as well as help in improving technology to filter these out. Due to their presence, studies on the effects of plastic in the environment and inside organisms are required extremely urgently and will unfortunately take a lot of time. So while this is going on, how can we rid our environment of microplastics? How can we, for example, filter microplastics from food and water? Well, since microplastics tend to break down into smaller and smaller microscopic pieces, these bits of invisible plastic can only be filtered by membrane filters, which work at almost molecular levels. However, to prevent further contamination, any filtered product from microplastics will still have to be safe from plastic exposure in the supply chain, transport, storage, and consumption, and should be free of exposure to the atmosphere. How do we eliminate plastics entirely? Well, complete cessation of access to new plastic and manufacture can only occur when the usage of fossil fuel ends along with the use of recycled plastic.